wholeness is not just this privatized, uh, psychological, personalized kind of a way of experiencing uh, depth of life. It's really about how do we love God well, love our neighbors well, love our and love our neighbors as ourselves. So at the core of what I'm trying to do in this project is reframe wholeness through the lens of loving well. Thanks for joining us today. So good to be with you. Thanks for the kind invitation. Yeah. Well, I, I think this book is uh, perfect for what we're going through right now. now you, you pastor a very large, diverse uh, congregation. Just curious, did this come out of what you were seeing from the people in your church? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the, the books that I write really flow out of my own context, and it just so happens that my context uh, is not the only place that's experiencing the kind of challenges uh, in our world. And so uh, I, I like to think that we're living or have been living in a CPR kind of a world, a world that's been marked by COVID, uh, political hostility, racial challenges, and the convergence of those three powers have brought, a lot, brought out a lot of polarization, challenge, angst, and, but, and I've seen that in my very diverse community because whatever challenges are outside in the world because of the nature of our community, always finds itself uh, into the life of our people. So absolutely, this flows out of the life of our church. You said CPR. Does that mean we, we need resuscitation? Is that what, is that what you're Our about? hearts are ailing, that's for sure, mm -hmm. and we're having a hard time breathing. So yeah. that's without question. You know, what's scary to me is that it seems that we're almost getting used to the hostility. Like mm. we're getting used to everybody choosing a side even to the violence that's going on the other day, I was so appalled to see like a subscript uh, mass shooting here. And then it went on to, and the local celebrities doing this and that. And I was just, <laughs> yeah. whoa, you know, what does this world come to kind of moment? Yeah, it's such a transient in terms of what, what what's viral, uh, what moves from one thing to the next. Uh, we have, I think, become very numb. Uh, to the nature of the world that we're living in right now, which for followers of Jesus uh, presents, I think, a great opportunity for us to hold space in really intentional ways and not move on too quickly, uh, but to really discern what might God be saying to us in this moment. Well, the title of your book, Good and Beautiful and Kind, sounds wonderful. So <laughs> what, what inspired a title like that? You know, the title emerged from a poem that I read a number of years ago from the, the great African-American poet Langston Hughes. Uh, mm -hmm. Hughes wrote a poem entitled Tired, and a lot of people know what that feels like. And he says, I am so tired of waiting, aren't you, for the world to become good and beautiful and kind. Let us take a knife and cut the world in two and see what worms mm -hmm. are eating at the rind. And that poem really speaks to the longing of our souls, the longing of our society for goodness, for beauty, and for kindness. And also, uh, it's a recognition that there's something beneath the surface of our lives and our society that's really keeping us from living in that reality. So mm -hmm. the title from that book emerged from that really powerful and beautiful poem. Mm -hmm. I love that. Uh, you know, going back to what Sally said, like you turn on the news, uh, you turn on, well, not our radio station, but you turn on <laughs> other stations and it just reinforces how messed up everything is. And then here you are, on the other hand, talking about wholeness. And I was hoping you could expand mm -hmm. on that some. You know, when I think about wholeness, there's a number of words that come to mind. I think of words like integrity. I think of words like integration, like our, our lives, the various parts to our lives are held together. But at the core of wholeness, what I'm trying to do in this book is to uh, express wholeness as the act of loving well, uh, that our world is made whole and our lives are made whole by our ability to love well, which seems like uh, something deeply rooted in the story and the teachings and the life of Jesus and and what the church is to be. And so wholeness is not just this privatized, uh, psychological, personalized kind of a way of experiencing uh, depth of life. It's really about how do we love God well, love our neighbors well, love our love our neighbors as ourselves. So at the core of what I'm trying to do in this project is reframe wholeness through the lens of loving well. Mm, that's good. 
Uh, you do talk about how often we, we have a lack of awareness of the spiritual powers and principalities in our culture and that possibly we're being used by those. What? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You, you know, it's an interesting, uh, you know, Paul in Ephesians 6, he talks about we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against these powers, these rulers, these authorities and that we cannot see. And when I think about what's happening in the world, it's very easy to point the finger at this is what's wrong. This is who's wrong. This is why the world is in the mm -hmm. state that it's in. And certainly uh, as human beings, we have responsibility for the decisions that we make. At the same time, the biblical story helps us to see that there's something that we're often not seeing with our eyes, that there are larger powers that are at work in our world that find their way in individuals, ideologies, and institutions that have a way of depersonalizing, that's marked by deceit and deception, that's marked by division. And um, the powers that are at work, you know, it's very easy. I, I became a Christian in a Pentecostal context. Uh, and whenever something wasn't working, it was always a, some demon. You know, if, if, if the PowerPoint wasn't working, we, it was some demon's responsibility. <laughs> so we had to pray. Uh, and so every, everything was a demon if something went wrong. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, in a very modern and postmodern world, uh, folks don't even have the language to think about larger forces that are at work in our world. But I think Christians are to hold on to this tension that, no, not every problem is attributed to Satan and, and demons and such. Uh, but there are some forces that are out in the world that are wreaking havoc. Uh, and so in my office, I have on my, my whiteboard a question that as a pastor, I like to think on on a regular basis. And the question is, am I being used by the powers? Mm. Uh, is my, are my words, is my life, are the decisions now being marked by uh, that kind of depersonalization, deception, and division? Or am I uh, being used by the way of the kingdom of God to work for something that is holistically in contrast to that. But there are larger forces that work in our world for sure that we must contend with. You know, it's a good point that anytime I think you entertain something that's obviously of the enemy, aren't we agreeing with him, you know? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and I, if I speak that thing, that thought, that's, that's saying what he would say. So, Ooh. yeah, I mean, we, we have to be aware of what's going on there. Absolutely. And, and it's very easy. You know, we, we like to say, um, uh, you know, Jesus might live in your heart, but grandpa lives in your bones. That's a phrase that we use in our church. So there's some there's something historical to our lives that forms us very deeply. And the same can be said about the larger forces around us. Uh, it is possible. There's a very fascinating passage of scripture where Peter confesses Jesus as the Messiah. And then, you know, two verses later, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, to the same guy <laughs> who just confessed him as the Messiah. And what Peter was, he was so caught up in a worldly system that the Messiah could not experience the kind of suffering and pain and death that was that he had no imagination for that. And he was trying to keep Jesus from what Jesus came to actually do. And so in one minute, he's being used by God. In another minute, Jesus is saying, you're being used by the devil right now. And I think that's kind of the reality for many Christians in one minute to the next. In the New York second, we can vacillate and be used by God or be complicit with the larger powers around us. And I think that's a call to great humility and discernment in our lives. Mm. Not that I should tell someone to get behind me. Uh. Uh, <laughs> maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of us have gone through something uh, traumatic in our lives. I think you're probably hard pressed to find somebody who hasn't, honestly. And you talk about how we can find wholeness and, and healing in the book, saying uh, we often find it difficult to love well because we haven't understood the deep stories of trauma stored away within ourselves and others. And I was hoping you could talk about that a little bit. That's fascinating. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think of all people, Christians should have a category, a theological, a sociological, a psychological category for trauma. And one of the reasons is because we follow a wounded, the word trauma really means to, to wound. Mm. And we follow a wounded savior, one who understands what it means to live in a wounded and wounding and traumatized society. And so mm -hmm. it's often the case that some Christians um, uh, feel like that kind of language is psychologizing too much. 
uh, and people are, there's a larger issue that they want us to attend to. But I think we need this category uh, to help us. Uh, when I think about trauma, I think about this uh, 1950s uh, British psychiatrist named D.W. Winnicott. And he mentioned that trauma often happens uh, in two ways. One, it's that something happened that should not have happened or something didn't happen that should have happened. Hmm. Uh, and I think we need both of those because not everyone will experience the same levels of woundedness and trauma, yet um, we all have gaps and deficiencies or did not receive what we should have received, maybe from our primary caregivers, our parents and such. But I think until we can understand how uh, much we've been wounded in the world, which informs our actions and reactions in the world until we can really pay attention to the stories of the people around us. Uh, I don't know if we can live towards wholeness, which is why mm -hmm. the author Parker Palmer said, uh, the more you know about someone's story, the harder it is to hurt or hate uh, that person. Mm -hmm. And I think when we understand the level of pain that people have endured, it's not an excuse for whatever they do or whatever they say, but I think it helps us to understand a little bit more why people are the way they are and to, by God's grace, meet them in compassion and in grace and in truth. But I think we need that category to help us move towards wholeness. That's good. That's huge. Yeah. You yeah. know, just to put your feet in their shoes, if you will, and helps mm. you with your perspective on just about everything and the people that God puts in our lives that sometimes we're like, why Lord, <laughs> you know, the difficult ones. And yeah, your, your book is all pointing us towards the power of loving the people in, in our lives that it's not happening apart from God's knowledge. So I have this question for you because you have a phrase in there that I haven't ever used and I'm not familiar with. So talk to us about contemplative prayer. First off, just tell us yeah. what it is. Yeah. When I think of this kind of prayer, you know what it is more than anything, it's seeing prayer as communion with God as opposed mm. to um, transactionalism. Mm, uh, yeah. Prayer is often marked by so much transactionalism. I say mm. particular words in a particular way with a particular emphasis, passion, heart, Bible verse, and I do my end of the bargain, and God is now responsible for responding to my prayers in the way that I want. And I believe mm. in petitionary prayer. I believe in intercession. I think we need all kinds of prayers. But I often think that for the average Christian, prayer is often seen as I say certain things and God does certain things. And so God becomes mm. this cosmic Venmo, this cosmic vending machine, where mm. can you put something in my account uh, because I've said certain things in a certain way, whereas contemplative prayer is really the act of sharing presence with God. Mm. Uh, you can you can actually um, uh, it, it's it's revelatory to see um, the the amount of words we often need with people determines often our familiarity with them. And if I just met someone, I'm going to need a lot of words. Uh, because it's a bit awkward to have long intervals of silence and just sharing presence. But when I'm with my wife, when I'm with trusted friends, I'm able to just share a presence with them but where my, my very presence becomes communication of love, communication of gift and uh, affection. And I think contemplative prayer is essentially that. It's my way of recognizing God is closer to me than I am to myself. Those are the words of St. Augustine, that it is in God that I live and move and have my being in the words of the apostle paul in the book of acts god is so near to me mm -hmm. and i just want to share presence and it's remarkable because in the act of simply sharing presence and stillness and silence and solitude not only are we hopefully our awareness of god is heightened but our brains and our minds are actually uh impacted positively as well and so when i think of romans 12 too don't be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of our mind mm -hmm. i know paul did not have uh silence and solitude maybe he did but i don't i'm not sure if he had this in his mind to that degree but i think contemplative prayer offers us an opportunity to be present to the presence of god which in turn hopefully can train our souls to be present to our neighbor which i think is what we desperately need in a world that's tearing itself apart. So what you're saying is in a typical conversation, especially with somebody new, it's like, oh, no, 
There's dead air. What are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Panic. It's the exactly. worst. <laughs> oh, no. But, but with God, that's a good thing, just to have space with him. Hmm. Absolutely right. And I think the, the depth of intimacy is often reflected just in shared presence without the need wow. to be our, have uh, uh, our relationships marked by verbosity. And I think the same applies with God, which is why much of my prayer time with God, and I journal, I have my repetitions, but so much of my words that I offer to God flow out of five, 10, 15 minutes of just silence with God, mm. recognizing mm. I just wanna be with God. I don't wanna get anything from God right now. I just wanna be with God because God is wow. graciously offering me his presence. And so I just want to return the favor as it were and not have our relationship marked by, um, again, transaction. Uh, I want to mm -hmm. be marked by more presence. That's a fascinating yeah. thought. Oh. Um, I'm not trying to get something from you. I just want to be with you. Oh. And by the way, Pastor Rich, isn't that the way we should treat all of our relationships? Because when you look at it like that, that sounds horrible. The only reason I'm talking to you is because I'm going to get something back. You know? I mean, it makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Uh, wow. and, and I think that is the hope. The hope is that our souls get trained where we begin to actually uh, become more present uh, to people, uh, whether mm -hmm. they can help advance our careers or what have you, or if they can't do anything for us. We just want to be present to them because they are people made in the image of God. And I just want to be present in that way. So yes, that kind of prayer is not just uh, a personalized, privatized way of feeling good about myself. It's to train me for the sake of love. Mm. That's good. You talk about the uh, the life of Naaman and uh, that it can say a lot about his story about humility and wholeness in our lives. Talk about that. You know, humility. I wrote a chapter on humility because I thought that humility really is the gateway virtue to uh, all the other virtues that we long for. That if we don't have humility, we're going to have a hard time cultivating other virtues. And I love the story of Naaman. It's an Old Testament story, and he's this powerful general. Uh, who has an army of Syria at his command, but he has leprosy. He has a, he has a debilitating skin disease. It's the COVID-19 of mm -hmm. his day. It's just a really <laughs> bad situation. And uh, he, his, his uh, servant hears that there's a guy named Elisha who can heal. And so he goes to Israel to get healing. But Elisha says, uh, the only way you're going to get healed is if you go to the Jordan River and I'm not even going to come out and talk to you, uh, but dip seven times in this, you know, um, it's not, it wasn't filtered water, that's for sure. And, <laughs> and then you'll experience healing. And Naaman, who's used to being in control, who's used to calling the shots, now has a moment where he is called to be humble. And humility, as I explain it, is not simply the act of doing lowly tasks. Humility is the act of lowering, lowering our defenses. Uh, humility is a way of being in which there's nothing to prove, nothing to possess, nothing to protect. protect. That's humility. In a world mm -hmm. that is so defensive, in a world that is so self-protective, humility says, I am not going to live by the way of self-protection, possession, or proving myself. And that's what Naaman does. He takes off the armor. He does the humble thing, experience wholeness. And I think that's the invitation before us to the degree that we are moving in uh, our lives in the way of humility is the degree that we will experience personal and interpersonal wholeness that our lives and our world desires. Mm, that's good. Yeah. Um, I think, and humility plays a lot into uh, forgiveness and, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I know so many people speaking from personal experience that struggle with being able to, to truly forgive, uh, you know, and do you think that we are moving farther away from that capacity to be able to do that just in this crazy world that we live in? And, you know, I was hoping you would talk about that model for extending forgiveness uh, and reconciliation that you lay out in the book. Yeah, you know, when I think about forgiveness, yes, I think the world that we're in is increasingly less forgiving, I think. I think we have so polarized ourselves uh, that it's a category that people have no room for. But I think part of, part of the challenge of forgiveness, even before the age that we're li living in right now, is for forgiveness has not uh, been seen in comprehensive ways. 
as Christians, we are taught we need to forgive. And so it's often been something that we've done with our words, but without recognizing the larger hurt, the larger process of grief and lament that needs to speak to the ways that we offer forgiveness. And so I remember reading a book a number of years ago uh, called Don't Forgive Too Soon. Don't Forgive Too Soon, which sounds like, what? What do you mean? <laughs> and uh, what I found helpful about that is the, the writers, uh, Matthew and Sheila Lynn, uh, use the five stages of grief as a template to understanding forgiveness as well. Oh, and I just found it so helpful because uh, in the five stages of, of, of grief or the five stages of dying, you know, it's like it, there's denial, there's anger, there's bargaining, there's depression, there's acceptance. Hmm. And in forgiveness, it's often denial where I don't admit that I was hurt. And that, you know, I, I forgive you. Don't worry, I wasn't hurt. Or then there's anger, you know, it, it's your fault that I'm hurt. And there's bargaining where I set up conditions before I'm ready to forgive. And then, you know, it might be depression where it's my fault that I'm hurt. And then acceptance, you know, I look forward to uh, growth from the hurt. But I think Christians so easily uh, have uh, this truncated view of forgiveness where if you don't do it immediately, uh, that there's something wrong with you. And I think that requires um, a, a greater patience to our own humanity, uh, that there is hurt that we must grieve and there are things that we must wrestle with, uh, that our forgiveness needs to come from a deeper place. And so the reason why people carry for unforgiveness for so long is because they've never allowed themselves to actually go through this journey. They just mm. said, I forgive. And then it comes up three months later, oh, and you're holding it back again, but maybe we have not gone through the journey that we need to, to explore actually what's happening in our world. So that forgiveness becomes truly uh, a place coming from the depth and center of our lives by the grace of God. But I, I think in order to do this requires a much more comprehensive view of what forgiveness is. Wow. You know, as I look at the title again, good and beautiful and kind, I have to ask you, as God kind of birthed this concept and this entire book through you, how has it impacted your life personally? You know, it's interesting because on one level, I wrote the book out of pastoral concern. I see what's mm -hmm. happening in the life of my congregation. I see what's happening in the church in our city and the church in yeah. our nation. And so I write from that place. But I mean, I'm also writing out of my own personal struggles. Uh, I'm writing out of my own woundedness and brokenness and vulnerability. And so uh, whether I'm talking about conflict, whether I'm talking about forgiveness, whether I'm talking about humility, contemplative prayer, um, I think um, I I'm sure this is a case for the vast majority of authors. We write the books that we need the mm -hmm. most personally. Mm. And so the reason I write a lot about prayer is because I know the tendency I have to avoid prayer. Uh, the reason I write a lot about, you know, forgiveness and humility is because I know deep down inside, I do not want to live a life that there's nothing to protect, nothing to possess, nothing to prove. My life is often oriented around proving myself and protecting and, and hoarding and possessing. And so uh, all the things in which you'll find lots of personal stories in this book, because it didn't, it did not just emerge out of just some ambiguous theology, uh, some theory that I'm just trying to make more palatable to people. This is emerging from my own failures and my own mm -hmm. wrestling with God. Uh, and so I think every page to some degree is a reflection of my own ongoing struggle uh, in trying to be a follower of Jesus. Is wow. there, uh, you talked about stories. Is there a story that comes to mind you could share? We love stories. <laughs> You know, uh, because we just brought it up earlier, I think about the story of, of, um, of the trauma. Uh, you know, I recall uh, there are some people in my church. I know um, you and your listeners don't have any of these people in their churches, but um, of it, course it was not. just giving me a hard time. You know, just, just, <laughs> uh, just <laughs> I know it's only in New York, you know, uh, and. And I remember I was about to have another conversation with this person who like every four months just sends me an email and I'm just thinking, oh. gosh, I have to have another conversation here. And as I'm waiting to have this conversation, I never forgot where I was. I was on Queens Boulevard uh, in New York City about to make a left on the stoplight to get to the church. 
and dreading this conversation when uh, one of our fellow pastors called me and said, hey, and I said, hey, I'm meeting with this congregant. And I said, I- I'm just so frustrated and this is driving me nuts and, you know, pray for me, all that stuff there. And the pastor said, well, do you know uh, by any chance this person's story? And he began to tell within, you know, two minutes the level of loss and trauma and pain mm-hmm. that this person has experienced over the years. I mean, catastrophic loss that I did not know. Mm. And he just simply said, you know what, when you're with this person, just keep that in mind. That doesn't mean you're going to excuse when they cross boundaries and when they say something that needs to be corrected. But just have that in mind when you uh, have this meeting with this person. And I'll tell you what, when I sat with that person after getting that greater understanding of their stories, that was their story that was beneath the surface, something shifted in my soul for this person where I was able to just be more present, less aggravated, less irritated. And certainly I did not walk in there with a sense of just, you know, I was not walking on water after that conversation here, but Uh, there's something in my soul that was a lot more gracious and present because I did know the story a little bit more of that person. And I think that's what we're called to in this moment. Can we take time to more and more learn the stories of the people that we are in relationship with, especially those that we don't see eye to eye with? And I think as we do, uh, we will, uh, God will use that to form grace and compassion and love in our souls so that we can truly be present to them. So that's just one of the stories that uh, comes to mind in my life as a pastor. That's, that's really good. You know, it just reminds yeah. me how important what you did say is that to try to find or get to know somebody, try to find their story. Uh, wouldn't it be fantastic that as you meet somebody, there's a sign above their head that says, I've experienced trauma. This is what I'm going through. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so we don't have that background, and it's easy right. to get upset with somebody. But, but you're right. If we know what's going on in their lives, it adds, well, you have empathy, you know? It, it, yeah. And to, your, and to your point, I think, I think we should just naturally assume that everyone has that sign over their head. Yep. No mm-hmm. matter where they're at, I think every person that we meet – has experienced some form of wounded. Not everyone to the same degree, but we all have gaps in our lives. And I think if we can uh, have that recognition, it'll change the way we interact with one another. Yeah. Mm, you know, just good. speaking for myself, as I'm hearing you talk, I'm feeling so convicted. Of how often do I wander into a conversation so I can prove my point? And mm. I miss their story. It doesn't even occur to me to ask what their story is and you know before i'm just in there saying here's here's my thoughts <laughs> you, you need to hear more of my thoughts and opinions yeah. you know it's just i don't think i'm alone in that but no. i i am personally just feeling that conviction as i'm hearing you talk and just after pouring through this book and and just thinking you know what he's right it's about love and it's about reflecting christ to the people that he brings in our lives the good the not so pretty and, you know, um, the difficult. So, Mm. wow. Appreciate that. Good Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, one more question for you, then we'll let you go. Pastor, what (laughs) brings you joy today? What's bringing me joy? Wow. Um, (laughs) Well, at this, I'll tell you right now, at this very moment, what's bringing me joy is today is the last day of school for my children. Uh, (laughs) And uh, and in some ways, they're going to be in the house a lot more. So that should not be giving me much joy. (laughs) Uh, uh, However... Uh, however, uh, I am celebrating that I don't have a long, as long of commute as I have because we just moved recently. So that's the first thing that's given me joy. Uh, what else, what else is giving me joy these days? Uh, you know, it sounds really strange. I, I watch a lot of Marvel shows. Oh yeah. Television, you know? And so, uh, I discovered recently these reaction videos, you know, I didn't know that there's a world of reaction videos that are out there. And I have met so many, I've never met them, but they're, they're like my best friends now, these reactors to like the shows that I love. So that huh. when they're crying to the things that I'm crying about, I'm just like, this is bringing me so much joy. And so <laughs> I know, I know you were expecting prayer and Jesus and all that. Of course, that's Jesus is going to be great joy. Uh, well, well, my children are going to school and these reaction videos are bringing me much joy these days. That's fun. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Yep. Oh, yeah. I love it. I love it too. Well, 
thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you. Um, mm -hmm. What a great concept for the book. We all need it, that's for sure. So, good stuff. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Well, you have a wonderful day.